It's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. And now the stage is yours. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be in Oslo. The subject of my lecture is the science delusion, which is the belief that science has already answered the basic questions about the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. There are many people who believe this, especially people who've made science into a kind of religion. Um, and what I'm suggesting this evening is that science is not a belief system, science is a method of inquiry. And it's being held back by this dogmatic system of beliefs that became dominant within science in the 19th century and uh, which science has actually outgrown, although most people don't realize it. What I do in my book is to take the 10 dogmas of modern science and to turn them into questions. So instead of just accepting them as a matter of faith or just taking them for granted, I'm treating them as scientific hypotheses and then I examine how well they stand up when they're examined in the light of scientific evidence. So this is a scientific inquiry about science in the spirit of radical skepticism turning skepticism on the basic assumptions of science itself. The result of doing this, I think, will be to free science from these dogmas and to make it more scientific, not less. I'm very pro-science. I'm all in favor of science and reason as long as they're scientific and reasonable. Um, so first, I'll just summarize the dogmas and then I'll discuss some of them. I don't have time this evening to discuss all of them. The first dogma uh, that was established in the 17th century as the foundational assumption of modern science is the idea that nature is mechanical. Nature is like a machine. Um, it's machine-like. Animals and plants are machines. Our bodies are machines. Our brains are machines. They're like genetically programmed computers. In Richard Dawkins' vivid phrase, we are lumbering robots. The second assumption is that matter is unconscious. We live in a universe made up of unconscious matter. All the stars and galaxies and the whole of outer space are full of unconscious matter. This earth is made of unconscious matter. Uh, animals and plants are basically made of unconscious matter and so are we. Third, the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This is the principle of conservation of matter and energy. All of us learnt it at school. And it says that the, the there's a fixed quantity and it never changes. Fourth, the laws of nature are fixed. The laws of nature are the same today as they were at the time of the Big Bang and they'll be the same forever. Fifth, nature is purposeless. There are no purposes in nature. If animals and plants seem to show purposes, this is just a kind of illusion. And uh, the whole evolutionary process has no purpose or direction. It just develops as a result of blind chance and uh, blind laws. Sixth, biological inheritance is material. Everything that's inherited biologically is inherited in the genes, the genetic material or in epigenetic modifications of the genes, or in cytoplasmic inheritance. Uh, so everything is material in inheritance. Seventh, memories are stored as material traces inside brains. Everything you remember is somewhere inside your head, in chemicals or in modified nerve endings. Uh, the memories are all inside the head. Eighth, the mind is 
nothing but the activity of the brain. Mental activity is all inside the head. It's nothing but brain activity. Nine, psychic phenomena like telepathy are illusory. They may appear to happen. Many people believe they've had them, but that's because they haven't been properly educated in science uh, because scientists know that these things are impossible. And they're impossible because the mind is confined to the inside of the head. So thoughts and intentions cannot possibly have any effect at a distance. So all the evidence must be flawed, fraudulent, or illusory. Tenth, mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. Um, there are many alternative and complementary therapies, but none of them are real medicine. Uh, sometimes people get better after seeing alternative therapists, but that's just because they would have got better anyway, or because it's the placebo effect. But the only kind that really works is medicine based on physics and chemistry that treats the body as a machine. And that's why official medicine is based on uh, surgery, physical treatments, or drugs. Uh, and that's why governments all over the world spend most of their, if not all, of their research money on mechanistic medicine. In Britain, the Medical Research Council, the government funding agency that, sp uh, that spends one billion pounds a year of taxpayers' money on medical research, spends 100% of it on mechanistic medicine and 0% on any alternative or complementary therapies. Why? Because mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. It would be a waste of money to spend any time examining these other systems because we know in advance they must be wrong. So these are the basic ten assumptions which are the default mindset of educated people today, especially scientists. But not just scientists. These are, this is the belief system that dominates the media, governments, corporations, and the educational system. It's what's taken to be the scientific worldview. But actually, it's a dogmatic belief system uh, that arose uh, in the 19th century uh, with, based on mechanistic roots in the 17th century. It's essentially the philosophy of materialism, which is a worldview or philosophy, um, not a science. It's a philosophical worldview that took over science and has dominated it ever since. My argument is that if science is liberated from these dogmas, it will still be science. It will be better science because the spirit of inquiry will be free instead of inhibited by these beliefs, which mean that any deviation from them is treated as heresy. And heresy damages careers. Most scientists, if they think differently, don't say so in public because they're afraid. Well, I'm going to start by looking at the doctrine of the conservation of matter and energy. This is the dogma that I myself never questioned until two or three years ago. Um, I thought this was the most solid and best established of all the beliefs within science. And I actually rather wanted to find that it was true because uh, in my book I was arguing that the other beliefs are false and I thought if I said all ten beliefs are false uh, that would seem rather biased. I, I actually quite wanted to find one that was true. Um, but when I examined the evidence for the history, for the conservation of matter and energy, I found this is one of the most shaky of all of them. First of all, we have to look at the history of these beliefs. They're all of them assumptions that started off as reasonable, even liberating assumptions, but which then solidified into dogmas uh, and are now almost unquestioned. People who believe these things don't realize that they have a belief system. They think other people have belief systems, but they know the truth. And so it's not that most scientists are simply unaware of the fact that these are beliefs. Anyway, with the, the uh, doctrine of the conservation of matter and energy has roots in ancient Greece. In ancient Greek, Greece, the philosophers were preoccupied with the idea that what is real is eternal. Um, they probably got this idea from mystical experiences. Mystics through the ages have said there's a kind of reality we can directly experience which is beyond space and time. It's not in space and time. And this eternal reality is more real than the world we live in. In ancient Greece, different schools of philosophy tried to turn this mystical experience into philosophical theories. One way of 
ex describing this eternal reality that lies behind the world we know was taken by Pythagoras and his school. They said the eternal reality is mathematics. Mathematics transcends space and time. Ratios, numbers and proportions um, are the ultimate truth and they underlie everything in nature. Plato generalized the Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theory to say that uh, the eternal reality is made up of ideas or forms, the eternal archetypes of everything in nature. Every horse, for example, is the reflection of a horse idea beyond space and time. So those are two very influential approaches to the nature of eternity. But another school of thought in ancient Greece, the materialists or atomists, uh, thinkers like Democritus and Epicurus uh, put forward the idea that the eternal reality is matter. Matter is made of lots of little bits, atoms, and the world we live in depends on eternal matter made of atoms being rearranged and permutated and moving within the void. So this materialist theory was a very ingenious way of solving the problem of eternal reality which rejected Platonism and Pythagoreanism. But it was not based on experimental evidence, it was just a clever philosophical idea. In the 17th century, with the growth of modern science, atomism was revived in Europe, um, uh, but with the idea that God created the universe in the first place, and therefore God created all the atoms. Um, and because atoms can't be destroyed, and because they were made by God in the first place, they were eternal. Therefore, the total amount of matter remains the same because the atoms which make up matter can't be destroyed. In the 17th century, the founders of modern science also thought that the world was a great machine and that God was like an engineer or mathematician that designed the machine, made the machine, and then started it in motion at the beginning. And after that, the world machine went on automatically just by itself. That meant that to set it in motion, God had to impart movement to the universe. And the founders of modern science thought the total amount of motion or force uh, would always be the same because it was given by God in the beginning and God is eternal, so therefore the total amount of matter and energy couldn't decay. That's the theological root of the doctrine of conservation of matter and energy. It comes from a peculiar kind of mechanistic theology in the 17th century. In the 19th century, these beliefs were codified in the principle of conservation of matter and energy. And in, in the 1850s, the principle of conservation of energy was made the first law of thermodynamics. After that, most scientists have simply assumed that these laws are true. They've never been proved with accuracy to many places of decimals. They're just assumed. Of course, they're useful accounting principles in chemistry and in physics. Um, and to make equations, you assume the total amount before and after a change is the same. That's why it's an equation, it's equal, because the total, these quantities don't change in total amount. So for accountancy and for doing, making equations, these are useful principles. But are they ultimate truths? Well, most of us like to believe that, or would like to believe it when we're told it at school, because we think it's ultimately true, it has all the authority of science. But physicists have been uh, less bound by the laws of nature than the rest of us. In the 1980s, it turned out that within galaxies, stars are moving around the center of galaxies much too quickly to be explained by the gravitational mass of the galaxy. It also turned out that galaxies are attracting each other much more than they should do if you add up all the matter within them. Adding up all the matter means adding up all the stars, the gas clouds, making a generous allowance for black holes and planets which can't be seen with telescopes. Uh, make a generous allowance for all that. And that gives you the total amount of matter and it's not enough to explain the observed facts. So either the theory of galaxies and the way the universe works is wrong or there must be a lot more matter than anyone has ever observed. Most physicists simply assume there's a lot more matter than anyone's observed. Because you can't see it, it's called dark matter. And how much dark matter is there? Well, 
find out how much you need to make the equations of uh, <laughs> physics balance, and you add it into the equations, and then you've got the perfect answer. If the observations change, you just change the amount of dark matter. It's as simple as that. And uh, if you find a galaxy is bulging in a place you wouldn't expect it to bulge, then there must be a cloud of dark matter around there uh, or uh, that's distorting the form of the galaxy. You can add it in wherever you like, in whatever quantity you like, to produce the correct result. And this must be good physics because you get the right answer. <laughs> well, there's no independent evidence for this dark matter and nobody knows what it is. Its nature is literally obscure. Um, but having added all this dark matter in, about five times more than the amount of ordinary matter, the universe obviously had a lot more matter than anyone had thought before, and that meant it would have a stronger gravitational pull. As you know, the universe started expanding at the Big Bang, according to the conventional theory, and uh, as it expands, uh, it of course gets bigger, but there's a countervailing force, the pull of gravity, of all the matter in the universe is pulling it back in. If the amount of dark matter was increased as it was, then the gravity is increased and the universe should be slowing down as it expands because of the extra matter. It should stop expanding and then begin to contract until everything ends in the reverse of the Big Bang, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. So um, the theory predicted the universe should be contracting or at least it should slow down and then begin to contract. When people made observations on distant quasars and galaxies in the late 1990s, they discovered the exact opposite. The universe was expanding faster and faster instead of slower and slower. So that's a big problem. There has to be something radically wrong with the theory, or else there must be another kind of energy that's pushing the universe apart that no one knew about before. So that's the answer. Dark energy will explain this. So how much dark energy? Just the right amount to explain the facts. <laughs> um, and the theory works perfectly. But nobody knows what it is. Uh, there are various theories of dark energy. Some say that it's called quintessence um, and, and is variable in quantity. Some uh, derive it from Einstein's cosmological constant by giving it the right value to explain the results. Um, and if you do it from Einstein's cosmological constant, you come up with a very disturbing fact. As the universe expands, the amount of dark energy increases. There's more and more as time goes on. The universe is a perpetual motion machine. Some physicists argue that this increased energy is offset by changes in the pressure of the universe, and therefore uh, it's not really increasing. But in practice, the amount of dark energy is increasing. The total amount of dark matter and dark energy are now believed to make up 96% of reality. The matter and energy you learned about in school is less than 4% of what's actually there. Does the dark matter obey the law of conservation of matter and energy? Does dark energy? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what they are or how they work. And the total quantities change from year to year as physicists change their equations and uh, modify them in accordance with observations. There's also in physics another mysterious, mysterious source of energy, namely the quantum vacuum field or the zero point energy field. This is an essential part of modern <coughs> quantum theory and it tells us that the matter that we know about, everything we're familiar with and everything that's described in physics, are like waves on the surface of an ocean of energy. This ocean of energy is in the quantum vacuum which is not really a vacuum, but a plenum. It's full of energy. There's enough of this energy in a teaspoon to power the Earth's energy needs for centuries. It's this vast reserves of energy in just in space, according to physics. Now, some people claim that they've made devices that tap this sort of energy, that, that can use it technologically. There are many people who've developed machines which they claim are above unity machines. Above unity because you get more energy out than you put in. Sometimes they're called free energy machines. Most people who've made them believe that they're tapping the quantum vacuum field, this vast reserve of energy in the quantum vacuum field. When people develop these machines, and there are probably 20 or 30 
moderately credible inventions of this kind in the world at the moment, if you do a Google search under above unity machines or devices, you'll find millions of hits. Um, when people develop these machines and they, talk, they go and talk to professors of physics about them, uh, um, are these professors of physics delighted, saying, fantastic, this will solve the world's energy problems, reduce the need for carbon-based fuels, make Norway bankrupt because of oil exports <laughs> going down? Uh, no, they don't say that at all. They say, this is impossible. These machines can't work. These people are cranks. They're madmen, uh, and we know they can't work because they're perpetual motion machines, and perpetual motion machines are prohibited by the law of conservation of energy and the laws of thermodynamics. They're outlawed, so they can't exist. So people who have these devices find it very difficult to get them funded. When they go to big companies, the big companies call up their physics advisors, and the physics advisors say, don't bother with these people, they're completely mad, it's impossible. That's because these laws of conservation of matter and energy say it can't happen. Now, what if it can happen? What if these people are right? They can't possibly put their claims forward within the arena of orthodox science because it's outside the limits of science, beyond the pale of the dogma. Where can we go from here? I want to know if these machines really work or not. I don't know if they do or not, but I have an open mind. I suggest that the best way forward is through a competition. If I had a great deal of money, which I don't have, but if I did have, I would put up a prize of a million dollars for the best above unity device and have an international competition uh, to find out whether any of these companies or individuals do have devices that work, have fair tests carried out by competent engineers uh, to see if they really work not in an attempt to debunk them, but in a genuine attempt to see if they work, treating them fairly and objectively. Now, if any of them work, they'd win the prize. If several of them work, the ones that work best would win the prize. If none of them work, uh, the conservative scientists who deny the possibility would have the pleasure of saying, I told you so. But now they would have some evidence to back up their view instead of pure dogma. And in fact, not only would I launch a prize, I would uh, encourage bookmakers to uh, have a betting system so anyone could take part in betting whether anyone will, will win the prize or not. Those who are against uh, these things and think they're impossible could put their money where their mouth is and stake large amounts of their money on no one winning the prize. I think, myself, when they were asked to put lots of money on it, some of them might become a bit more cautious. Uh, but this would make it fun. Uh, it would be something the media would like. The finals could be shown live on TV. And it would transform uh, the scientific world, if any of these devices work, and transform the world of technology and the economy. So I think this is one question that's wide open, but it can't be addressed within the present dogmas. And this is one example of how thinking in a broader way could lead to better science, because if they don't work, well, you can prove they don't work instead of just assuming it. Um, if they do work, we'll learn something truly new and very important. Well, I want to turn next to the idea that the laws of nature are fixed. The laws and the constants of nature were all fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. This doctrine is another uh, legacy of ancient Greece. In the 17th century, the founding fathers of modern science, um, Kepler, Galileo, Descartes, Newton, and others, um, were all convinced that the mind of God was a mathematical mind. God, for them, was a mathematician. They were basically Pythagoreans or Platonists. And they thought that through science, uh, humans could understand the mind of God. And this is why many of them thought science was superior to religion. In the 17th century, Europe was torn apart by the Thirty Years' War and other wars in which Catholics and Protestants were killing each other. That's when modern science developed. And its appeal to many people was that it provided a third way, a more certain way of knowing the mind of God, because the mind of God could be known precisely through mathematics. Newton's law of gravitation was taken to be an insight into the mind of God, not just a human description of part of nature. Um, 
So they thought that the laws of nature, the mathematical laws of nature, were eternal because they were divine. This habit of thought, this platonic habit of thought, is extremely deeply embedded in the minds of mathematicians and physicists. Even today, most of them are Platonists, although they won't usually admit it in public. But that's their uh, most deep belief. I know many mathematicians and physicists, and almost all of them are Platonists, if you ask them uh, what they think the ultimate reality is. They think it's maths or uh, mathematical principles or laws. This is deeply embedded in the habit of scientific thinking. And this was not a problem until 1966. In 1966, the Big Bang theory became orthodox with the idea that the entire universe began 14 billion years ago and has been growing, developing, and evolving ever since. So what about the eternal laws of nature in an evolving universe? Why shouldn't the laws evolve as well? How do we know they were all fixed at the moment of the Big Bang? The answer is, we don't. It's simply an assumption carried over as a habit of thought from a previous platonic kind of cosmology and theology. So, what if the laws evolve? As soon as you ask this question, you realize that the idea of laws of nature is a metaphor. Only humans have laws and only civilized humans. Tribes have customs. It extrapolates in an anthropocentric way um, the, this human preoccupation with law onto the whole of nature. In the 17th century, it was a p political metaphor. God was the cosmic emperor. He was also the cosmic law enforcement agency that made sure everything obeyed the laws because he was omnipotent. Um, and the metaphor made perfect sense in this kind of 17th century imperialist and mechanistic type of theology. But in the 20th and 21st century, when most scientists are atheists, or at least uh, pretend to be atheists in public, ma many are not so atheistic in pri private, um, you can't have the mind of God as the source of these laws. Uh, we're just left with free-floating laws uh, and the habit that they've all been there and fixed since the beginning, the habit of thinking that. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. But if we rec recognize that the laws of nature are a metaphor, then we could see that human laws do actually evolve. The laws of Norway today are not the same as they were a hundred years ago. So why shouldn't the laws of nature evolve? But better, Instead of calling them laws, I think it's better to change the metaphor, because it's only a metaphor, um, uh, to the metaphor of habit. If we have evolving habits of nature, then I think we have something that explains the regularities of a universe, an ev evolving universe, much better. Habits, instead of involving a mind outside space and time, involve memory inside space and time. And I think that nature has a kind of memory. This idea of habits is not a new idea. C.S. Peirce, the American philosopher, put this idea forward in around 1900, the idea that an evolving universe would have habits. Um, um, I think so too. My own theory of cosmic and natural habits is called morphic resonance. I think that similar patterns of activity resonate across time from the past. Uh, to reinforce similarity later. There's a kind of memory in nature. Each species has a kind of in collective memory to which each individual contributes and on which they draw. This leads to a lot of predictions. One is if you make new kinds of crystals for the first time, a new chemical, then the first time you crystallize it, there won't be a habit for it, that lattice structure or crystal form. The more often you crystallize it, you know, the more the habit will build up. So it should get easier to crystallize all over the world. It gets more habitual, it happens more easily. This is what chemists find. New compounds generally get easier to crystallize all over the world. They explain it in terms of fragments of previous crystals being carried from laboratory to laboratory on the beards or clothing of migrant chemists, or else <laughs> as invisible dust particles being wafted around the world in the wind, by the wind. Um, I think this would happen even if migrant chemists are excluded and if the dust particles are filtered from the air. 
There's other tests in the realm of chemistry, which I describe in, in some of my books on morphic resonance. In the realm of behavior, this theory predicts that if you train rats to learn a new trick in Oslo, then rats all over the world should learn the same trick quicker just because the rats have learned it here. And there's already evidence from a long series of experiments at Harvard, in Edinburgh, and in Melbourne, Australia, that that's exactly what seems to happen. Rats seem to get better all around the world on the basis of the experience of rats elsewhere. Now, this may seem incredibly improbable and surprising, but the evidence uh, is there, and it's from a very long series of experiments, one of the longest in the history of psychology. Um, anyway, I'm not going to dwell on my own theory, because it's not my purpose this evening just to talk about my own ideas. I'm looking at the bigger picture in science. So now I'll turn briefly to the constants of nature, uh, because these two are supposed to be constant, as the name implies. I'm referring now to the fundamental constants, like the universal gravitational constant, big G, Newton's universal constant, or the speed of light, C, uh, which is a one of the most central constants of modern physics. Now, are the constants really constant? Just to ask that question is shocking and forbidden from within science, but you can ask it, and you can actually look up the data. And when I first asked this question, I looked up the data by getting handbooks of physics, which are published at regular intervals, um, and looked at the back editions. I got them out of the patent office library in London. They wheeled in a tray of these discarded, outdated handbooks of physics from dating back for 70 or 80 years, dust-covered volumes. Um, <coughs> And I looked through the speed uh, to find the speed of light. And to my surprise, I found that the speed of light dropped by about 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945. <laughs> and, and the error bars were very small. They gave values with very small errors. Then in 90, after 1945, it went up again, and they had very small errors. So it wasn't as if this drop was in the range of error. Uh, the errors were supposed to be very, very small and then it went up and they were still very, very small. So I couldn't understand this. I didn't know what to think. So I went to see the head of metrology at the British National Physical Laboratory. Metrology is the science which measures constants <coughs> and measurements. Um, he kindly agreed to see me and I asked him, um, what about this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945? I said, uh, could this mean that the speed of light varies and that maybe it even moves in cycles, uh, goes through cycles of change? He said, no, no. I said, why not? And he said, well, it can't possibly vary. And I said, why not? He said, it's a constant. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I said, well, then how do you explain the fact that all around the world uh, people were getting these measurements for years, uh, which were so different from what's the present value? And he said, oh dear, he said, you've uncovered one of the most embarrassing episodes in the history of our science. And so I said, so you agree that there was that? Yes, he said, yes, the data did indeed go down all around the world. Um, so I said, well, how do you explain it then? If the speed of light's a constant and everyone was getting these different values, were they all fudging their results to get the result that was fashionable? And so the whole thing's a kind of sham, a pretense of accuracy uh, when they were actually bogus data, or at least adjusted to what they thought was expected. I said, well, was this, a, a, was this some kind of fudge going on through a whole physics community? He said, we don't like to use the word fudge. And I said, well, what word do you prefer? And he said, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. <laughs> um, so I said, well, in any case, you're explaining this as a kind of collective delusion among metrologists. So how do we know that's not happening today? He said, oh, we know it's not happening today. And I said, how do we know? And he said, we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. It can't change anymore. <laughs> so uh, um, I said, but what if it does change? We might still know. No, we'd never know, he said. We've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the units will change with it. So that's fixed forever. It can't change. So he seemed very pleased with that outcome. Um, <laughs> So I said, well, what about the gravitational constant? That's been varying by more than 1.3% in recent years. It's still varying, even more, actually, at the moment. Uh, and he said, well, that is a bit of a problem. We're working on it. Um, so um, 
when, when you look at the data for the gravitational constant, they're surprisingly variable. Uh, what they do at the moment is different laboratories in Germany, Britain, America, and so on, take measurements at different times, then they average them. If any of them look too far off, they discard those as they're called outliers, and they just reject any data that don't agree with their expectation. But the ones that are in a narrow range, they average. And then every five or ten years, the International Committee of Metrology meets and takes the measurements from Britain, Germany, America, and so on, France, and uh, they average those uh, and to come up with the value of G, the best value of G. And they do it again ten years later, and it's usually different. Um, but what if G varies according to the Earth's position as it moves around the Sun? What uh, if the whole, as the whole, assist, whole solar system moves through the galaxy, if it goes through a cloud of dark matter, if dark matter exists, this would affect these measurements of G. It would mean that at some times all of them around the world might be high and at other times all of them might be low. So what about looking at the data from different laboratories, the raw data, and seeing if there's any correlations or fluctuations. I've been trying to persuade metrologists to do this for 15 years. Have any of them done it? No. They haven't done it because there's no point in doing it because G's a constant. <laughs> I'm suggesting uh, an exercise in open science where these laboratories put their raw data with the dates online and make it open to anyone who wants to, to analyze them and see if they can find patterns. And there could be a website where these would be reported. This, I think, would open science up. It would cost almost nothing. It would lead to an interesting debate. Uh, and I hope that it will happen. But here's another example of where this dogmatic thinking inhibits in discovery and research. Now, the unconsciousness of matter. Matter is unconscious. How do we know? Is this something that scientists have carefully studied through detailed experiments and treated as a refutable hypothesis? No, nothing like that at all. Matter was defined as unconscious in the 17th century by a French philosopher, René Descartes. And uh, we've all gone along with it ever since, just because this Frenchman said so. It's a very poor reason for believing it, in my opinion. Um, and why did Descartes say that matter was unconscious? Because he had a machine theory of nature. Descartes was the first person to see nature as a machine. He had this vision on November the 10th, 1619. Um, uh, he tells us in his own account. Um, he had a, a vision. He thought this was revealed to him by the angel of truth. Nowadays, we'd say it was channeled. So the most basic insight of mechanistic science was channeled. And uh, he thought that it was done under the aegis of our Lady of Loreto, a black Madonna, and he went to Loreto three years later to give thanks to Our Lady, the black Madonna of Loreto. This side of mechanistic scientific history is not normally taught in schools or universities. <laughs> anyway, Descartes thought that nature was mechanical, made up of unconscious matter, that the world was not an organism but a machine. Animals and plants were just machines. Our bodies were just machines. The only thing that wasn't mechanical in nature were human conscious minds. And he then made a complete split between unconscious matter and conscious minds. This was the famous Cartesian dualism. Conscious minds were in the realm of spirit, which is not in space and time. And human conscious minds inhabited this category along with angels and God, whereas everything else in nature was mechanical and unconscious. That was his philosophy and the way he defined uh, the nature of matter. Well, did he prove it? No, of course not. He just assumed it. It's just a theory. And uh, it didn't cause too many problems at first because humans were still conscious and religion could still go on. Uh, but he created this sharp duality a duality between humans and the rest of nature. We're conscious, but the rest of nature isn't. Animals are just machines, so we can grow them in factory farms or vivisect them or do what we like with them because they're just machines. Um, and a sharp division between body and spirit or body and mind, an in insoluble duality. <coughs> and a, a, sh a sharp division between the realms of science and religion. Religion got the human mind, angels and God. The science got the whole of nature. Um, and by having this division of labor, they lived in more or less good harmony or reasonable harmony for two centuries or more. 
So Descartes said matter was unconscious and he created this famous dualism. Most of the, all the founding fathers of science were devout Christians and they didn't, they were not atheists, they were mechanists but not atheists because they were dualists. God and human minds were in a different category from matter. Um, but many people didn't like this dualism. They thought that two uh, things was too many. They just wanted one. Personally, I think two is too few. I think we have to start from a trinity, a threefold system, to get a reasonable explanation of nature. And Descartes collapsed a trinity into a duality. Uh, and uh, then people said, well, we don't want a duality, we just want one thing. So there's two ways of dealing with that. Uh, one school of thought is to say, spirit or mind is the only reality. This is the idealist school of philosophy. Matter is kind of dumbed down mind. Um, the other school, which became predominant uh, in science in the 19th century, is materialism. It says matter is the only reality. Mind is simply produced by matter and doesn't have any independent existence or reality. And um, that became the dominant philosophy in science in the 19th century. By the end of the 19th century, science was not just mechanistic, but had uh, got rid of Cartesian dualism and become thoroughgoing <coughs> materialism. And modern science is a wholly owned subsidiary of the materialist worldview. Well, the problem, of course, with this materialist philosophy is it doesn't explain the existence of minds. It denies the existence of minds. The problem is that we are conscious. And indeed, we couldn't think about these things or do science unless we were. So how do you explain human consciousness? This is an irreducible problem. Within the philosophy of mind, it's called the hard problem because no one has an answer for it. Different philosophers of mind, most of them materialists, try to explain away consciousness by saying it's an epiphenomenon, it's just a shadow of brain activity that doesn't do anything, or else it's an illusion produced by the brain. But the problem is to explain consciousness as an illusion doesn't explain it, because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. It presupposes it. So materialism has gone round in circles in the, in the theory of mind, uh, each philosopher putting forward a new version of it. The other materialist philosophers then criticise it as showing that it's untenable. They put forward their new version, and that's cut shot down by the others, and so it goes on for decade after decade. A few materialist philosophers have now broken ranks. They've said, we can't go on with this. One of them is Galen Strawson, a British materialist philosopher. Another one is uh, Thomas Nagel, an American materialist um, a, a philosopher. who He's also an atheist, an eminent atheist. But he published a book last month, which I'm reading at the moment. It's an extremely powerful critique. It's called Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Concept of Nature is Almost Certainly Wrong. Um, so there's now an ongoing criticism within philosophy of mind, an increasingly powerful one. And both Nagel and Strawson say that we can only explain consciousness in humans if we assume there's some kind of mental activity all the way back through nature, right to electrons and atoms. It's a kind of panpsychism or animism. And this is rapidly gaining grounds within academic philosophy and science. But it's no longer materialism as we know it. It's a quite different philosophy of nature. It's one that was put forward in the 17th century in response to Descartes' theory by Leibniz, for example, who said that everything in nature is made up of units of organization or monads, and each monad has both a body and a mind, and each monad reflects the whole universe from its own point of view. Each one of us sees the world from our own point of view, which is different from everyone else's because we're literally in a different place. We can't occupy the same place at the same time as anybody else. In this room, each of us has a different perspective on the room. And he said the whole universe is made up of reflective monads. Spinoza said that the universe is the body of God and the conscious side of nature is the mind of God. Mind, God is the conscious side, nature is the unconscious or bodily side, and these are two sides of the same coin. In the 20th century, the most important uh, panpsychist philosopher was Alfred North Whitehead. And Whitehead was the first philosopher to appreciate the importance of quantum physics. Qua he pointed out that in quantum theory, electrons and atoms are waves. They're not 
enduring particles of solid stuff, which was the old view of matter. Instead, matter is made of vibratory patterns of activity. Matter is a process, not a thing. A wave takes time. You can't have an instantaneous wave. It takes it spread out in space and in time. It takes time for a wave to flow. And that means that everything is a process in time. Because it's a process in time, it has a past pole and a future pole. Now, Whitehead came up with, to my mind, the most interesting way of thinking of the mind-body problem. Uh, usually, people think of the relation of mind and body in terms of spatial metaphors. The mind is inside, the external world is outside, the body is outside, it's the inner life versus the outer world. This is totally cliched, common, ordinary way of thinking about it. He said that the relation of mind and body is not in space, but in time. In the uh, electron uh, wave, for example, there's a future pole and a past pole. The mental pole is the future pole. The physical pole is the past pole. The mental pole is concerned with possibilities. The past pole is where something has become physically measurable and, and uh, a, a measurable fact. Our own minds work like that too. Our minds are concerned with possibilities. Our conscious minds are full of their theatres of alternative possibilities. And the main function of our conscious minds is to choose among alternative courses of action. We have a lot of unconscious mental activity, which is largely habitual. But conscious activity is about choice between actions, possibilities. Interestingly, even in an electron, according to Schrodinger's wave equation, uh, the, uh, the movement of an electron is described by an equation which expresses all the possible things the electron could do. These are not physical facts. These are something beyond the physical. They, it's a realm of possibility. As soon as you measure the electron, or as soon as it interacts with something, all these possibilities collapse down to one actual fact, which is now in the past. And that's what you observe. It's sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. So Whitehead's view is that the relation of body and mind is the relation in time. Causation from the mind works backwards from virtual futures. Causation from the body works forwards, like a regular energetic causation in physics pushes from the past. Mental causation pulls from the future. And these two flows of causation overlap in the present and interact. I think this is much the most promising way of looking at the mind-body problem, and uh, it's part of Whitehead's panpsychist view of nature. So, if we come to the question again, the dogma, matter is unconscious. It's a much, much more interesting thing when you think about consciousness and when you realise that it can't be, at least in the case of our brains. And if you take our own consciousness seriously, which we have to, then, as Nagel shows in his book, this has knock-on effects right back through biology into physics, changing our view even of physical nature. And as soon as we think of material systems as having a mental pole, then the question arises uh, not just about electrons and protons and atoms, but about big material systems. The one I like to think about most is the sun. The sun is a self-organizing material system. It must have, according to this view, a mental pole and a physical pole. In other words, the sun must have a mind. It may be conscious. Now, you realize immediately that this is a prohibited thought. All of us are educated people who are part of the modern world, and you know you're not allowed to say, is the sun conscious? You know that your first reaction is meant to be withering scorn. Of course not. That's a stupid, primitive, childish belief. It's believed by primitive people, by uneducated people, and by religious people like Hindus. Uh, who have sun gods or the ancient Greeks. Children think it's conscious because they haven't been educated yet. That's why they draw the sun with a smiley face. But we know, because we're modern, educated grown-ups, that it's not conscious, it's just like a giant hydrogen bomb. We don't know that at all. We just assume it, because Descartes said so in the 17th century, and this has become a habit of thought within science. Uh, it's never been proved, it's not even been discussed, uh, within the realm of science. But it's a completely open question. You might say to me, well, you can't prove the sun's conscious. And I would say, no, I can't. But I would say to you, you can't prove it's not. Um, it's an open question. 
And if the sun's conscious, what about the whole galaxy? Is there a galactic mind that organizes all the stars and the pattern of the galaxy? And if the galaxy is conscious, what about the entire cosmos? Could there be a cosmic mind um, uh, for the entire universe? Well, that's certainly what people used to think, but we know, we, the usual view is we now know that the cosmos is just inanimate matter governed by uh, eternal laws of nature. We don't know that at all. Uh, we think we're superior to other people who've thought about these things. I think we're inferior uh, because they at least considered alternative possibilities. The uh, normal materialist position is one of extreme arrogance. It just assumes it's right without the need for any evidence or argument. So I think this opens up a huge range of questions. It brings, of course, into play the next question about the nature of our own minds. The dogma that our minds are confined to the inside of our heads uh, is, of course, a consequence of the idea that matter is the only reality, therefore they must be produced by our brains. But is there any evidence for this? Well, no, it's just an assumption. Um, uh, I myself think that the mind operates through a system of fields, extended fields. We're used to the idea of extended fields. Magnets have fields which are inside the magnet and extend beyond it. Uh, the Earth has a gravitational field. It's inside the Earth and extends invisibly beyond it, holding the Moon in its orbit. And the um, field of your mobile telephone, ha ha the electromagnetic field is inside the phone, but extends invisibly beyond it. That's why the phone works. This room is full of invisible mobile phone transition, uh, transmissions and radio waves and TV signals and wireless internet signals. It's absolutely full of them. But we can't see them. They extend invisibly beyond their sources. I think that our minds extend through fields into our environment all around us, uh, particularly in directed by attention and intention. Now let me say why I think this. Think about the nature of vision. What's happening when you see something? For example, when you see me standing here now. The standard view is well known. Everyone knows it. Light's reflected from me. It travels through the electromagnetic field. It enters your eyes, inverted images on your retinas, changes in the cone cells, impulses up the optic nerve, and then changes inside the brain, uh, patterns of activity in the brain which we can describe more precisely than ever before, thanks to fMRI and other kinds of scanning. But does that explain vision? Well, no, it doesn't. It just describes what changes happen in the brain. How do we explain vision itself? The first part is incomprehensible from the point of view of mechanistic science. You're conscious of what you'll see, you're seeing. This is the hard problem. There's no explanation for the fact you're conscious. Uh, but let's leave that problem aside and go to the next question, which is where are you seeing it? You're seeing me standing here now. Where is your image of me? Well, the answer is very clear. It's inside your head, according to conventional science. All your mental activity is inside your brain. Your brain somehow produces, according to modern neuroscience, a virtual reality display that arises from your nervous tissue confined to the inside of your head in three dimensions and full color. Somewhere inside your head there's a miniature Rupert talking and everything else in this room is inside your head and if you go out at night and look at the stars, the stars you're seeing are inside your head. All your experience is inside your head, so your skull must be beyond the sky. This is a logical extension of the conventional view. It was recently highlighted in a paper in one of the leading journals called Is Your Skull Beyond the Sky? The author of the paper, a materialist, said, yes, it has to be. Everything you're experiencing is inside your head. It has to be, according to the materialist view. Not very convincing when you think about it. Um, I'm suggesting an alternative hypothesis that's so simple it's hard to understand. And that is that your image of me is located not inside your head but outside your head, exactly where it seems to be, right here. Uh, it's in your mind but not inside your brain. Uh, you interpret what you experience and you, you create images. Those are all subjectively coloured and influenced by our whole image processing system. But the images you experience are outside your brain, not inside the brain. We project out our entire perceptual field, uh, world through what I call perceptual fields. They're a kind of morphic field. I don't have time to go into the theory of it, but um, 
let me just say this is the theory that, that, that there is a, extended fields uh, in perception. When we look at a distant star, our minds reach out, as it were, to touch that distant star. We project out the image to where the thing is. Normally, the image coincides with where the object is. If it didn't, it would be an illusion or a hallucination, and those are fortunately rare. Um, but normally, our images coincide with where objects are. So I'm suggesting that all our perceptual world is projected out. Uh, it's in the world around us exactly as it seems to be. Uh, we've all been brought up to believe it's not, but I'm saying it is. It, it's where it seems to be. This is what Plato believed, what Euclid believed, uh, what the ancient, most ancient Greeks believed. It's what Hindu and Buddhist philosophers believe. It's what traditional people all over the world believe. And it's what European children under the age of 10 or 11 believe. Jean Piaget, in his study of the child's conception of the world, showed that in the developmental psychology of children, until the age of about 10 or 11, children think that when they see things, some influence goes out of their eyes. That's why in Superman comics you see kind of rays going out of Superman's eyes. But by the age of 10 or 11, Piaget said, the average European child learns the correct view, which is that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the head. No doubt all of us learned the correct view, since we were no doubt all of us normal children. Um, and uh, from that age on, assume it must all be in the head, in the absence of any evidence whatsoever. No one's ever seen a thought or an image inside a head. Um, so um, this is a view that's hypnotized our entire civilization. And we think we're superior to everybody else by having this view when I think we're vastly inferior because we're making a, a rather stupid assumption on the basis of no evidence at all. But I'm putting forward this not as a philosophical idea but as a scientific theory and therefore a testable one. Um, that it makes predictions. If I look at you from behind and you don't know that I'm there, now I look through a window so you can't hear anything or there's no sensory information. Um, if I stare at your back, could you feel my gaze? Now, as soon as you ask that question, you realize this is a common experience. Surveys show that more than 90% of the population have had the experience of uh, turning around to find someone staring at them. Also, over 90% have had the opposite experience, staring at someone from behind, and they turn around. There is a slight sex difference. More women than men have experienced being stared at, and more men than women have experienced staring at others and making them turn around. <laughs> But the majority of great adults and children all over the world have had this experience. So what does science have to tell us about it? Until the 1980s, absolutely nothing. It was assumed that it was a complete illusion. Uh, there were various papers written on the prevalence of this irrational belief that should be eradicated through scientific education because it's a superstition. Uh, the fact that most people in the world believe it's happened to them was even further evidence it's a superstition because these are uneducated people. Scientists know better. Um, so this appallingly arrogant attitude inhibited any research on this for decades, centuries. However, it's easy to do experiments on this and I've been doing experiments that are so simple a child can do them and indeed thousands of children already have done them in schools in Britain, Germany and the United States. Uh, in these experiments, uh, the subject is blindfolded, uh, the other person sits behind them uh, in the more rigorous experiments behind a window or a glass or one-way mirror, and they either look or don't look in a randomized sequence. So you're doing the trial, you're the subject, you hear a click or a beep, you have to guess if you're being looked at or not. And you're right or you're wrong. By chance you'd be right 50% of the time. The scores are not very impressive, they're about 60% in the looking trials, but they're consistent over hundreds of thousands of trials, astronomically significant statistically. Um, it's a very artificial situation, but nevertheless there's clearly an effect. This experiment has been running in the Amsterdam Science Museum for the last 15 years. More than 20,000 people have taken part. The results are overwhelmingly positive and significant. The most subject, sensitive subjects are children under the age of 10. So here we have a phenomenon everybody's heard about. Um, the data show that it happens. I've looked at the natural history. I interviewed surveillance officers uh, in the British anti-terrorist forces 
the British police, the drug squad at Heathrow, the store detective at Harrods, uh, sheriffs in the United States, uh, and people in the army. And I asked them whether they'd had experience of this. They all take it completely for granted. It's, uh, they all know that if you're looking at others, they, they'll turn around and, um, and they'll feel that you're looking at them. Private detectives, when they're trained how to follow people, are trained don't stare at their back because they'll feel you and they'll turn around, catch your eye, and your cover's blown. You have to look at them a bit, of course, but you look at their feet, not their back. So in, among practical men and women, this is completely taken for granted. So it is in the martial arts, where they have training techniques to become more sensitive to being looked at from behind, because it's useful to know if someone's looking at you from behind. They might want to attack you, and if you know they're there, you'll be safer than if you don't know. Animals also can feel when they're being stared at. I've interviewed hunters and wildlife photographers, uh, and uh, this is a completely commonplace in the animal world. People can tell when they're being watched by animals. Uh, there's many examples of this, too. I think this ability probably evolved very early in the history of animal life. Um, if prey animals could tell when predators were looking at them, hidden predators, they'd stand a better chance of escaping than ones that couldn't. The natural history of this, however, is virtually unexplored because it's such a taboo topic. No naturalist, at least in the last 50 or 60 years, has felt they could possibly do this as a research project. It would wreck their career. So uh, here's another example of a silly dogma, arrogant and silly, which has inhibited research on something that's actually really interesting, which can be investigated very cheaply and simply, and which tells us, I think, that um, our minds reach out beyond our brains in every act of perception. Um, the very word attention in English uh, comes from the Latin word ad tendere, which means to stretch towards. Uh, our minds stretch towards things through attention. They stretch into things through intention, in tendere. I think our minds are extended all the time through perception and intention. In the case of intention, uh, we feel other people's intentions as well. This is a whole subject that I can only summarize in the remaining two or three minutes. Um, uh, but uh, telepathy is something which seems to depend on intention. I've done a lot of research on telepathy in animals because I think if it exists, it must be biological. I think it's normal, not paranormal, natural, not supernatural. And indeed, many dogs and cats are much more telepathic than their owners. Um, I, I wrote a whole book called Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Uh, it's, I think, the only book of mine apart from this one which has been translated into Norwegian. Um, and it, what I showed is that many dogs, about 50% of dogs, anticipate when people are coming home um, and they go and wait at a door or window um, uh, sometimes 10, 15 minutes, half an hour in advance and um, I found when I talked to my scientific colleagues about it they just said oh well yes it's just make-believe, it's folklore, it's anecdote, it's superstition they dismissed it, no curiosity at all However, if you do the experiments, it turns out to be real. I've done lots of experiments. We film the place the dog waits. We have a continuous record on time-coded videotape. We have people go at least eight kilometers from home. They come home at unusual times that they don't know in advance. We randomize the return times and tell them by mobile telephone when they go to go home. The people at home don't know when they're coming. And they, to avoid familiar car sounds, they travel by taxi, a different taxi each time. That's the most expensive aspect of this research, <laughs> the taxi fares. Um, um, cats do it, sheep do it, um, uh, horses do it, some rabbits and, uh, and, and ferrets and guinea pigs do it, and some and Norwegians do it. Um, uh, the uh, best documented examples of this human ability to know when people are coming home are from Norway. And the phenomenon here, I'm going to say it wrongly, but uh, the way it's spelt, it's Vardoga. And um, there was a whole book written on this by Professor George Higen, is it, uh, from Oslo University. I had it translated by a generous Norwegian psychical researcher uh, into English because there's no English translation available. I have my own private translation of this book, and it's a fascinating study. Um, 
It happens to some extent in Scotland, where it's called second sight, but Norway is the best documented place in Europe. It's common in Africa and in India among people as well. So I think what's happening is they're picking up the intention to come home. It's a kind of telepathic uh, intention that's picked up. The same is true of telephone calls. The commonest kind of telepathy in the modern world occurs in connection with phone calls. You think of somebody for no apparent reason, then they ring and you say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Or when the phone rings, you just know who it is before you look at the caller ID or pick the phone up. Surveys in Britain, Germany, North and South America have shown that about 80% of people have had this kind of experience, and I imagine most people here have. Um, again, what does science have to tell us about it? Well, until recently, nothing. For 100 years since the invention of the telephone, scientists had said, oh, well, it's just coincidence. You think about people all the time. One of them rings, you imagine it's telepathy, uh, but you forget the millions of times you're wrong. I imagine everyone in this room has either heard that argument or said it, because it's the standard default argument of all educated people. You say it to prove you're smart, that you're not being taken in by superstitions or folk belief. It's part of the sociological fact of being an educated person. You dis dismiss these phenomena because you think that proves you're clever. I mean, I used to do this myself. It's just normal. It's standard. Um, but where's the evidence? None. No one had done any research. I now do experiments on this. The basic experiment, you have four callers. You choose the callers, people you know well. You sit at home with a, mobile, with a landline phone. You're filmed on camera. We pick one of the four callers at random, ring them up and ask them to call you. They call you. The phone rings. Um, before you pick it up, you guess who it is. I think it's Andrew. You pick it up. Hello, Andrew. You're right or you're wrong. By chance, you'd be right one time in four, 25%. In fact, in these experiments, in hundreds of trials, people are right about 45%, massively significant. The p-value, for those of you who are into statistics, is one times 10 to the minus 12. This effect is more significant and more probable scientifically than the existence of the Higgs boson. Um, uh, this... Um, um, experiment is now, has now been replicated in the universities of Freiburg and Amsterdam, and I now have an automated version on my website. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in Norway yet. Um, the automated version, you have two callers. You register online. You put in the names, the mobile phone numbers of two people together with their uh, the name and mobile phone number. The computer picks one of them at random, sends them a text message asking them to call you at a landline, which is the computer. Uh, it puts them on hold, the computer rings you. Your phone says, caller ID says, telephone telepathy test. You answer it, it says, this is the telephone telepathy test. One of you, your two callers is on the line waiting to speak to you right now. Please guess who it is. Press one for Anne, press two for Bill. So you guess, the guess is recorded, and the line opens up and immediately you can have a chance to talk to them and see if you're right or wrong. You can talk to them for up to a minute. It then cuts off because I'm paying for the call. <laughs> um, 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 and um, these experiments are giving way above chance results. Um, these are simple tests. When I gave a talk on this research at Google Technical Talks a seminar series at Google headquarters, uh, it triggered off a lot of interest in this in Silicon Valley, where several people are now trying to develop apps for smartphones, intuition training apps, and other apps that enable these things to be tested. And I think that's the way to go. Um, I think if this becomes a social reality through you know, smartphones and uh, other things, then the question, does telepathy exist, will be solved. Of course it exists. Most people have experienced it. It, it really happens. The only people who deny it are people who, on the ideological grounds, call themselves skeptics and uh, deny it. And most skeptics I've encountered in Britain, I encounter them a lot because, of course, I'm one of their primary targets because uh, I do research in this area, um, is uh, the, I found that most of them are completely ignorant of the evidence. They're not interested in it because they know it's impossible. They know it's impossible because the mind's inside the brain. And they know the mind's inside the brain because matter's unconscious, because Descartes said so in the 17th century. Uh, they're absolutely certain. Anyway, that's enough to give you a flavour of the, some of the ways in which science opens up when one turns these dogmas into questions. And it makes science much more interesting, much freer, much more fun. And um, 
I think ultimately it makes it, well, immediately, it makes it more scientific. So my hope is that uh, as the dogmas of science slip away, as people uh, liberate themselves from them, um, that science will have a new, a renaissance of discovery and activity, and it'll probably be a lot cheaper as well. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that most people in the scientific and medical world are not convinced mechanists. They pretend to be so in, sub in, in public because they know it would damage their career uh, to go against the official dogmas. Uh, but in private, a great many of them have, have dogs waiting for them when they go home from the lab. Uh, they, they know when their partner's calling on the telephone. Uh, they've had mystical experiences or taken psychedelics that have expanded their consciousness. Um, they've had, uh, many of them pray or meditate or have religious beliefs. I think a majority of scientists are not card-carrying materialists. In public, you'd never guess it. But I think what will transform science is a kind of liberation movement where they come out of the closet, a bit like the gay liberation movement. And that could happen quite fast. Okay, well, that gives you a flavor. And we're going to move straight on to questions and answers. Thank you.